Okay, I think we will have a hopefully good discussion. I'll probably talk for about 15 minutes and then take your questions and comments. Um, as Joseph mentioned, I've been giving a lot of different lectures here, so they all focus on different things, uh, quite a bit on China um, and on Singapore's economy as well. Okay, okay so uh, just to set the background what my motivation is, if you look at the global and regional environment, we are in transition from a Western, especially US-led international order to one marked by more distributed sources of political and economic power with China, the major new player. Over the next 30 plus years, Asia will, be, will continue to be the fastest growing regional economy, uh, over half of world GDP by 2050. Southeast Asia will be the second fastest growing uh, region of the world after South Asia. Uh, Indonesia will become the world's fourth largest economy in ASEAN the size of the European Union. So future Asian and global growth will be driven by strong consumption demand from emerging Asian middle classes. Okay, so essentially right now world growth has been driven by global middle class demand dominated by advanced countries and is going to be dominated by consumption demand from emerging Asian middle classes. What are the implications for Singapore? Um, our colonial and post-colonial role as a comprador, meaning an agent for multinationals, will decline as they retrench globally to consolidate in large final markets, and I can go into all of these points if you want. They are enabled by technology to reach end clients directly through distributed networks rather than hub and spoke arrangements. And as technological convergence reduces less developed countries' need for more developed intermediaries. So what this means is in terms of global market and technological forces, multinationals will concentrate in large final markets, and if they want to reach uh, consumers elsewhere, they will go directly because technology allows this, and the technological conversion is, convergence is very, very fast. The rise of China does not substitute for the retreat of the West, if you believe there's a retreat of the West, because China is much more likely to directly engage with Southeast Asia due to being nearby, due to being big, due to similar levels of income, cultural and political assets, highly entrepreneurial and technological advanced businesses, and rapid learning. So I've been doing a lot on China lately, so I'm happy that some Chinese here can talk about it. So my point is China does not need us as a bridge. They like to do things themselves. And it's not clear we possess the deep cultural knowledge of our neighbors needed to be an effective bridge. As soon as the article reporting that I said this came out of Straits Times, the EDB called me and they come to see me tomorrow. Uh, and the people are coming up from the International Policy Division uh, and Asian businesses. So I think they were planning a strategy based on being a bridge. And then now I just said, not China network. Okay. Uh, here's a quote from a uh, German company, Lazada, now owned by China's Alibaba in, in Singapore. He says, we have deep knowledge about the regional marketplaces. We know the complexities there in each market which can't easily be replicated. I don't think knowing how to do business in Singapore is in any way relevant to how you build your business in the Philippines or Indonesia. So that's the most important thing. Just because you can do business in Singapore doesn't mean that uh, you can do it in business uh, or Indonesia. And he talks about the importance of languages and so on. So I asked one of my uh, former students, a successful tech entrepreneur means that cashed out a first venture already, and now on second venture, and doesn't and can fund the second venture himself. Uh, and I mentioned he's a minority race, Singaporeans. He says, Singaporeans, I asked him to comment on my thoughts. He said, Singaporeans have been living in a multicultural society for 40 odd years, yet I doubt a random man on the street would know another's racist re religious traditions, language, etc. The multiculturalism in Singapore doesn't run deep. So if you don't even learn about your own countryman's traditions, how are you going to learn about Indonesian or Vietnamese tradition? And this is Harman who said in a speech last year, when somebody asked, never forget, growing up as a minority is different from growing up as a majority, it is different. It requires extra action, extra empathy. Extra empathy meaning you have to read people, right? that understand other people. And 
that sense of sharing the same boat together. So these are my laws of international business. I give it all my international business classes. Lately, since I stopped teaching MBAs, I've been teaching mostly Chinese executives from state-owned enterprises on how to go global through our global leadership programs, and particularly in Belt and Road countries. Always see the world through the eyes of the other, and everyone's a minority in international business. This is the thing which struck the Chinese the most, because they don't know how to be a minority. You know, it's such a big, big uh, country. So this is a colleague who you phoned, whom I brought to Michigan uh, to talk to our Chinese SOE executives. They asked to learn about Indonesia, so I brought him in. And he's an anthropologist. He, and he said two things. You always see another country through the lens of your own. That's the only way you can see somebody else is through your own eyes. You will understand difference when you see how your own country is different. So his point was that the Chinese could understand Indonesia only if they understood China how different China is. Um, and this is uh, Minister Chan Chun Singh who said, having a command of the Malay language can help Singapore bridge Southeast Asia and the rest of the world. Businesses from other parts of the world see Singapore as a staging place for the rest of the region. However, we will be of very little value if we do not understand the language and culture in our backyard. Only by learning the Malay language will we continue to remain relevant to the region and the world at large. What, 10 years ago, um, uh, one of the former presidents of the SSA, Singapore Students Association at Michigan, came to one of my talks and he said, the one thing I regret is the advice you gave us, which was to learn Bahasa, because we have been teaching at Michigan Indonesian for like 60 years. And every year for 40 years, I tell the Singaporeans you should study Indonesian or Thai or Tagalog, which we also teach, or Vietnamese, and they never do it. Okay? And they give me all these uh, answers. So this guy, he was working for either KPMG or Deutsche Bank at the time. He had this huge book of John Wolfe's textbook on Indonesian mm -hmm. language. Because he said everywhere that he goes, like in Indonesia, people start speaking Bahasa to him. They think it's Indonesian Chinese. Okay. So, um, uh, you know, the reasons that Singaporean students, not just at Michigan, but MIT, Berkeley, have given me for not studying Indonesian. Uh, is they have no lot, 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 they have no room in their brain okay, because they spend so much time studying Chinese. Um, but this year, for the first time, and I, after I retired, three Singaporeans uh, studying first year Indonesian at, at Michigan, two PhD students and an undergraduate. So maybe the wave is catching the people are realizing uh, that. Before that, the Singaporeans at Michigan will always be studying French, Japanese, even Russian. And that's what they do. Mm -hmm. So my line is Singapore should be more than a bridge. Remember the Chinese don't need us as a bridge. And we should be part of the destination. And my economic analysis is the Southeast, remember world growth is going to be driven by the Southeast Asian middle class consumer market. Okay. Singapore's per capita GDP is many times higher than that of its larger neighbors. But indigenous GDP is only 55% of the total and unequally distributed. So Singapore's per capita income is 56,000 US dollars a year, okay? But the indigenous, that means the GDP accruing to Singaporeans is only like half of that, let's say 30,000. And that is very unequally distributed. So the mean of median Singaporean is earning much less than that. And uh, Southeast Asian big cities, mega cities like uh, um, Jakarta, Manila, Bangkok, typically have incomes two to three times their national average. They let's say that per capita income is $4,000, okay? So the big city will usually be more like $12,000, and also very unequally distributed. So there's a bunch of people there who are making $20,000, $30,000 a year, same as the average Singaporean. So my point is that the mid to lower income Singaporeans may be expected to consume at price points similar to millions of big city dwellers in Southeast Asia. Products and services developed for them, for us, can find a market in neighboring countries. So this is my Chinese, uh, the last group of Chinese executives. I have three groups uh, a year. Uh, one group is ICBC, the world's biggest bank, and they are there for um, nine months a year. We have a 10-year contract, now we're in year four. This group is from PICC, the large insurance company. As you can see, not many of them, 15 
forty percent are female, but they dominate seventy percent of the class discussion. It's the only class I've ever had in my whole life where women are totally overrepresented in the class discussion. Uh, and they came back there. This is a session on solving. They asked for a pro for a session on thinking internationally, like six hours, and the one on solving problems internationally, because they are the ones who have been selected for overseas assignments in Belt and Road uh, countries. So I asked them, what does thinking internationally mean to you? In the very beginning, before, before they had been there like more than a month. And this is from their, all their responses. Not to be self-centered. Okay? Consider things more comprehensively. Thinking in different perspectives and understanding of different cultures, accept and use them. Considering things and dealing with problems from integrated perspectives using information from global sources, not just where you are from, <laughs> not just from your government. You, know. you need to know about cultures, customs, regulation, and people from different countries so you can think about problems from their shoes. Explore the core culture of other nations based on the history, culture, and language, observing their citizens' behaviors, having a broader perspective and better understanding of events inside and outside of China, more open-mindedness, taking perspective of others, understand different culture, communication styles, style and view of the market. Note that these are all their responses. They were all about culture. Okay? View things in perspective of foreign or international tradition and culture. Be empathetic. Remember Talmud's point of empathy. Able to perceive the world from different angles. Appreciate diversity even though it's not comfortable. Think from diversified perspectives according to different situations, cultures, interests of different countries. We have to first admit that people from different countries think differently, so we must know the diversity in their culture and behavior. Um, to think from other countries' point of view, know what they're offering, how to achieve a win-win by cooperating with each other. And finally, think of foreign problems in Chinese way, think of Chinese problems in foreign way, and think of foreign problems in foreign way. Very good. Okay. So here we are. Uh, this is the Indonesia program uh, that I organized. It brought in uh, executives from chief ex-minister, our alumni from Indonesia. Brought in, uh, so this guy is a former minister. This guy is a Chinese-Indonesian whose family business has seven joint ventures with Chinese companies in Indonesia in mining. Uh, this guy is my former student. He studied Indonesian and Thai at Michigan. Tha Chinese and Thai, sorry. He studied Indonesian in Indonesia. He's a former president of General Motors Indonesia, the one that took him out of the country. And that's an uh, American um, uh, anthropologist who's worked in Indonesia for uh, over 30 years. In general, the Americans that I come into would never think of going somewhere without knowing their language. And that's why they end up in Michigan, because they teach 20-something uh, Asian uh, languages. So I think that uh, the summary is, for both West and East, Southeast Asia is a major location for business and economic engagement. Both will need to engage directly with Southeast Asia's diverse populations. China, as you can see, is already preparing itself too. For Singapore, in my major uh, talk on this, I had a lot more stuff on Singapore identity. This represents a return to our history of intense involvement in regional and global trade with multi-ethnic, multicultural partners. This is our history. Whether it's bridge or destination, we need to up our game with respect to intra-regional engagement. This requires deep cultural knowledge and understanding of our neighbors and of ourselves. You cannot understand others if you do not understand yourself. So how do we go about doing this? I hope that that will be one of the, the, the things that we will talk about here, and I'm done. So.